So with the next topic, um, with the ASH, let's review some of the important clinical trial reports being presented now at the, this meeting. Um, we basically earlier mentioned the phase two study looking at brintuximab vidotin as frontline therapy in Hodgkin patients over the age 60. And we heard about the excellent interim results, although we don't have any reports of uh, the durability of these remissions and, and things like that. We guess we'll have to wait to see about that. There have been other studies with um, brintuximab vidotin in patients with relapse or refractory. There was some updates, three-year updates, still showing that good responses. And we mentioned earlier that some patients actually will have durable remissions, as you mentioned, Andre, even after completing and stopping therapy. And uh, of interest is in our partners, the pediatric oncologists are now testing it also in relapse refractory Hodgkin lymphoma or anaplastic arterial. It seems that they, they tend, they, they're not included in our trials, but it's nice to know that there is activity for the pediatric uh, patients as well. I think just to change gears a little bit, there's also, there were two interesting um, trials with respect to the use of penobinostat, which is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. And one was a phase three randomized uh, placebo-controlled multicenter study using penobinostat uh, versus placebo in patients who had Hodgkin's lymphoma after finished, they had high-risk disease after autologous stem cell transplant being randomized to benabinostat or to basically uh, placebo. And another one, a phase one study of penabinostat in combination with ICE in patients with a relapse or refractory Hodgkins. Uh, I'm gonna address that to you, Anas. What do you think about those two, two uh, abstracts presentations? So before we start, so uh, HDAC inhibitors as a class have activity to a variable degree in, in uh, patients with relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma. There's at least two large trials uh, showed about 20, 25% response rate as single agent in, in a post-transplant setting. The first one was mocetinostat, which is class one, class four inhibitor. And the second one was panabinostat, which is more of a pan, pan DAC inhibitor. So panabinostat then, um, uh, uh, they treated almost 100 patients in, in what they initially called as a pivotal trial, showed about 24% response rate. So then they moved it into a randomized trial based on a single agent activity in a high-risk patients who receive autologous transplant. What I mean by high-risk patients, these are that at risk for relapse or progression after autologous transplant. Mm -hmm. So they did two-to-one randomization where patients would get panabinostat uh, once every three weeks, but every other week, or placebo. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the trial was stopped because the, the sponsor thought that there is no path for approval um, uh, after the single agent filing didn't go through. But now that with adequate follow-up of this abrogated a randomized trial, about 40 patients or so enrolled, surprisingly, the patients who received benopinistat did much better uh, in terms of progression-free progression survival compared to placebo. I think 28% versus 14% double the, the, the duration. Mm -hmm. So what to do with this? I don't know. It's a proof of principle. I think that an adjuvant setting in a high-risk patient may be beneficial. It, it, it needs to be determined, I think, in a larger scale, more, more well-conducted trial. And what's your feeling on the penobinostat ice combination? And then, yes, then, then if you have an, an agent that has a good single agent activity in 20%, but if you look at the waterfall plot, you can see about up to 70% of the patient has some benefit, mm -hmm. reduction in tumor measurements. It clearly is a combination-based uh, drug. So now, how do you combine it? There's different ways of doing it. I think the group at MD Anderson combined it in a pre-transplant setting with ice chemotherapy initially in phase one trial and see if there's safety and adequate signal, you can go to a randomized phase two. At least the early signal from the phase one trial, face value, it looks like maybe adding something. We need to wait in a randomized fashion to see what's, what's the significance of this strategy. Good, good. I think also um, we should keep in mind there's some very large trials that actually we're waiting for data for, but some of them are still enrolling. One of them is the Athera trial, which is a phase three trial looking at the efficacy and safety of brintuximab vidotin versus best support, and plus best supportive care compared to placebo and best supportive care. So basically looking at patients at high risk of residual Hodgkin lymphoma following auto transplant. So the study of Bentuximab supportive versus placebo and best supportive. Um, I think it'll be interesting. Any preliminary data on that that you know? No, the study is completed. Uh, I, I, I would like to point one more thing here, that now all these trials taking clinical prognostic factors that predict a high relapse rate. I think the field is evolving towards detecting minimal disease right. and then probably offer these patients, these, these agents, instead of offering to everybody. 
this technology didn't exist for Hodgkin lymphoma in the past, but now they're using more se sequencing technologies, and there's abstract will be presented in this meeting. Yeah. You can actually detect minimal disease, even for Hodgkin lymphoma. Right. So it'd be interesting to see how would this adjuvant therapy would evolve for Hodgkin lymphoma in the future. And picking these up by blood tests, basically. Yes, that's right. I think that's actually very exciting, and as long as, and there is, appears to be a correlation that if we can pick up minimal residual disease early and intervene with less aggressive therapy, potentially put that patient back in remission without a lot of uh, toxicity. That would be a very exciting field, or very exciting findings. And there's an Echelon 1 and 2 trial. The Echelon 1 is a phase 3 randomized two-arm trial of uh, brenbutuximab vedotin plus AVD versus brenbutuximab plus ABVD. It basically is frontline therapy and classical Hodgkin. In other words, try to understand whether or not you need ABVD with brenbutuximab or can you get rid of the bleo and just use the AVD and and Bertuximab, and I know that you've actually been very involved in that trial, and I was wondering if you can comment on the preliminary results you've seen, and, and any unique toxicities that might have been seen in that trial. So, so uh, the traditional drug development is that when you have a high response rate, a single agent in relapse setting, the natural reflex is to move it up front and see if it adds value to frontline regimen. So that's how it evolved, taking Bertuximab, move, move it up front to combine with ABVD. Surprisingly, when it's combined with ABVD in the presence of bleo, there was excessive lung toxicity. So there was up to 40% of the patient had bleo-like lung toxicity. This led to a, a, a black box warning that you should not combine brentaximab with bleomycin. And that's why now you see the randomized trial that Echelon 1, it's AVD plus brentaximab versus ABVD. This is ongoing, up to like more than 100 patients enrolled internationally. And I would encourage all physicians to enroll patients in this trial because it may potentially change the standard of care in the future. And just to mention, the Echelon 2 trials of phase 3 study of brentuximab vedotin with CHP versus the standard of care, with standard care versus CHOP with uh, brentuximab vedotin in patients with CD30 positive mature T cell lymphomas. I guess, Steve, are you involved with that? Yeah, um, that's a study. There was a, a, a phase 1 2 study, which maybe I'll let Andre talk about, uh, exploring the combination of brentuximab vedotin with CHOP, dropping the vincristine for concerns about toxicity. So those results have led now to a randomized phase three studies, uh, adding brentuximab vedotin to CHP versus CHOP alone, which is still our most commonly used upfront regimen in T-cell lymphoma. And very similarly, based on the uh, results of brentuximab vedotin, at least in anaplastic large cell lymphoma and maybe angiomunoblastic and other T-cell lymphomas, the hope is that that, that can improve uh, not just the CR rate, but the cure rate uh, for those patients. And also, the CHP means we took out Oncovin or Vincristin. What do you think? The reason for that is pretty clear, isn't it? I yeah, in the, in, the, in the phase one, it was, it was uh, preemptively eliminated, um, thinking that that was um, possibly the least active drug in CHOP in terms of T-cell lymphoma. We don't have really single agent data on that, and that if the Brentuximab vedotin was adding a lot, we would rather get that drug in and not compromise in terms of toxicity.